Anyone could see the game was over by that point. In fact, I was just about to issue an official surrender when they released those parachutes. You released those parachutes? You really think I gave the order? We both know I'm not above killing children, but I'm not wasteful. That's, of course, a clip from the movie Hunger Games, a film that's getting a lot of extra attention lately as the line between film, movies, entertainment, and live-action role-playing and real life all seem to be getting more and more blurred. Now, this is a topic we don't talk directly about in my upcoming interview with the very excellent Kurt Jamungle, who has a terrific new movie out, Better Left Unsaid, about the impossibility of talking with woke people, even for progressive left-leaning men of color like Kurt. But I think a lot of the issues are the same. Like, take, for example, this clip. Well, even if they say they have no values, their body acts as if they have values because they move. And they value something above not talking if they talk. So just by their actions, they convey their values. And again, I, I just think you, you go back and talk to Shermer and ask him and see what his answer is. But what I've done with Shermer is- You can ask him, push- do you value science? Do you value truth? And he might say yes. He values it as a social construct. That's fine. That's fine. He can say he values it as a social construct. He still no, values it. I don't it. think it's fine at all. I think it completely, it completely skates the issue. The issue is, as you've put your finger on, I think, is there a moral imperative? The, the question is, who are we? Why are we here? Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome Kurt Jamungle the Skeptico. Kurt is a very accomplished filmmaker and actor based in Toronto. You know, I initially contacted Kurt because I was super impressed with his YouTube channel, which I'm actually showing up on the screen here, and some of his just excellent interviews on consciousness, atheism, free will, and all the interesting stuff we love to talk about on on Skeptico, um, highlighting one that he did with Donald Hoffman with over 143,000 views. Fantastic. We all know Don Hoffman was one of my favorite guests to have on and is featured in the book that I have. So since my initial contact with Kurt, he has released this pretty amazing movie, just extremely well done movie called Better Left Unsaid. So I thought what we do is kind of shift the focus a little bit over to this movie. And I'm showing his IMDB page, which is quite impressive as well. But we'll, we'll just kind of talk about a bunch of different things. I'm going to, of course, give him the usual skeptico inquiry to perpetuate doubt treatment. He won't escape that, but he's a really smart guy, so I know he can take it. Kurt, welcome to Skeptico, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. By the way, I read your book, read it last night. It was way, it was far better than I expected. Not to, not that I didn't expect it to be. (laughs) Wait a minute. What kind of backhanded compliment is that? I was, uh, I was impressed. And especially the, let's say the first 66, the first two thirds, it's almost exactly in line with what I'm interested in anyway. Yeah, I think there's a great intersection there. Um, But I think we can help people maybe jump into this even better if we share a trailer from the new film. This is Better Left Unsaid. And I'm going to play it and we'll just kind of listen and then we'll ask Kurt to comment on it and tell us in his own words what the movie is about. I, four little children, will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. You're a white male! You know what? You're still responsible! The world is upside down. I thought the whole idea was to not judge people by their skin color. That's what racism used to mean. I can no longer teach contemporary moral problems. Anything that involved issues of race and gender seems to me a minefield. Racism's been redefined. Sexism's been redefined. The 
fuck up. This is, this is all through the culture. And if we can't talk, what's left? I'm not a Nazi. Why are we not taught the historical consequences of those who viewed the world through optics of groups that have power and groups that don't? Is this not the central problem of our time? Powerful stuff. Great stuff. Tell us more about this Kickstarter, super successful Kickstarter that you did. You obviously have resonated with a lot of people. Tell us about what the movie is all about and what the reaction has been so far. Sure. So the reaction hasn't, the reaction has been extremely positive from everyone who doesn't identify as being a leftist and people who identify as being not on the left, but a part of, let's say, the extreme left or radical left, they tend to not like the film. People who are center left, center and center right, seem to extremely enjoy the film. Okay, as for what it's about, my background is in math and physics, so I'm extremely analytical, and I hear it's insensate clamoring of people on the let's say the radical end of the left. And I'm trying to make sense of it, especially in the university. That's where I was trained. So I'm like, okay, what's going on when people say that white people can't be racist and that it's an inveterate part of their constitution, racism, it's almost like original sin in the Christian doctrine. Can't get rid of it, you're born with it. You get, they don't like to be called essentialists. Essentialist means that there are subsistent qualities of you that you can't get rid of. It, it seems contradictory, but part of what I like, part of one of the reasons I liked your book, by the way, Alex, is that even though I'm, let's say, a mathematician or a physicist by training, I'm not a mathematician. Like, man, that's an honor that I can't claim. I'm not a physicist either. I just have training in that. Now, even though I have, even though I have training in that, most physicists as you know, most physicists and most people who call themselves scientists dislike ambiguity. They dislike what they can't define. They dislike what they can't prove or disprove. And they dismiss almost, they have a swift dismissal of what seems contradictory and meaningless. So I share almost all the traits with scientists, except that I find that part of, maybe that's my artist side. Anyway, so I'm trying to analyze this and see why, what sense is there in the senseless? That's what this movie is, is about. How did it get this way? What's right about what they're saying? What's wrong about what they're saying from my perspective with an analytical background? That's pretty much it. So you, you touched on a couple of interesting things there. I, I might just return us to Donald Hoffman, since we do, both have a lot yeah. of respect for the guy and you did an outstanding interview with him, and he was super impressed by your interview, which is always a great measuring stick, I think, you know, because YouTuber comments to me aren't quite as significant as when Don Hoffman says, wow, you really did a good interview. I got to take that as a, as a higher compliment, which he did for you. You know, when I talked to Hoffman, one of the really interesting exchanges we had was I was talking to him about spirituality and I was talking to him about Eckhart Tolle and he paused for a minute and a smile came over his face and he says, I have a lot of respect for Eckhart Tolle and I meditate on a regular basis. And then he told me a story that I think gets to the first part of what you're saying. He says, one day I was giving a presentation and somebody, uh, came up at the end and in a very kind of smirky way said, the language of God is silence. Everything else is meaningless. And Hoffman said, he stopped for a minute, he thought, and then he said, okay, I can live with that. If we're going to be silent, then I can be silent. But everyone who has a religious point of view about what God is, about what spirituality does, it, it ultimately follows that up with pages upon pages upon books upon volumes about not silence, about what the rules are. And he said, so if we are going to speak, let's try and be as precise as possible. And he said, 
as a mathematician, that's what I love about math. It keeps me in check in terms of being precise. And I wonder if there isn't a strange link to what you were saying about your analytical approach and how much frustration you feel with academia, which has come, has overtly just disassociated themselves with precision, with reality. And we can argue that part of that is a reaction to what they see as an absurdity that was done in the past, either from a social justice standpoint or from a religious standpoint. But still, we wind up in this place where they've kind of left the dock of reason and don't even pretend to have a need to go back to it. And that's what I think your movie does, just an incredibly uh, direct and and well-argued way of just exposing that for what it is. So do you have any thoughts on, on that? With regard to academia leaving precision, I think what you're referring to is the non-STEM fields. STEM fields are all about rigor, and I like that. But the non-STEM fields, their job is to be not precise. So that's not my problem. My issue in the film is you have to have a value. So you have to say, what is this for? Is this for the flourishing of society? Is this for the pursuit of knowledge, wherever it takes me. So you have to have some value, you have to have some aim. What seems to have happened in the non-STEM fields is there's something called modernism, which is actually people misuse, it's modernity. It's not modernism. Even though I use the term modernism in the film, it's just because most people use it that way. Modernism is the, art, the artistic movement. Mo modernity is the philosophical framework that comes along with that. So what came from modernity was the enlightenment or the enlightenment spread modernity, one of those two. Then you can think of that as skepticism. When I was talking to Michael Shermer, I asked him what's wrong with postmodernism because to me, postmodernism is the same as skepticism, just applied universally. He didn't give me an adequate answer except to venerate science and just say, well, that's what we shouldn't be skeptical of. Anyway, going back to the non-STEM fields, they have a postmodern bend, which means they dislike all values. Well, where will that lead you? It seems like they don't dislike all values. It also seems like they're influenced by what's called Marxism. And Marxism in and of itself doesn't seem so bad on the face of it, because it's all about sharing. It seems egalitarian. It seems even Christian. But yet, it seems like there's something more darker and pestilential under the surface. Under the surface. So the non-STEM fields are influenced by postmodernism, Marxism, and a few others, even some of what I like, like existentialism, they're influenced by, but I don't bring that up in the film. It, it was just a moot point. So the non-STEM fields, when you talk about lack of rigor, I don't care about that. That's fine because art is lack of rigor. And also re remember at part of my core, it's like rigor and art because I'm a filmmaker. So I like art. It's just the value. What are you critiquing underneath? Are you critiquing, and what are you aimed at? It's basically, what are you aimed at? That I, I'm not quite sure of, and I don't necessarily agree with in the non-STEM fields. See, I kind of look at it slightly differently. And my approach is that fundamentally, there's only two questions that we're asking across the board, whether it's Don Hoffman at Caltech as a physicist, or whether it's one of the wacky quote unquote philosophers that you're talking to in the postmodern academia. And the two questions are, who are we? Why are we here? Essentially, that's the question. It's also the question of religion. That's the question of religion. Who are we? Why are we here? My feeling about uh, the soft sciences, academia, are that they've built their castle on sand, on a foundation of sand, it doesn't hold because they have a fundamental misunderstanding of consciousness. They've bought into this Michael Shermer supported idea that consciousness is an illusion, consciousness is an uh, epiphenomenon of the brain, and that therefore there can never be a moral imperative. There can't be. If the universe is meaningless, if we're biological robots in a meaningless universe, there cannot be 
a moral good and bad. And so I think the, the sleight of hand that's been done, and some of them are aware of it and some of them aren't, is that if you don't understand consciousness, if you accept the radically absurd idea that consciousness is an illusion, then you, you, you can't go anywhere. What do you think about that? Okay, let's get to the fundamental nature of consciousness afterward. I'm going to comment on what you said directly with two religious references. So there's someone named Hildegard de Bingham, I believe. She was a, a Christian monk. And now I could be completely mangling this, but in the Middle Ages. And she has a passage that resonates with me. Now, now you're, a Christian. Something like, you're, you're a Christian, right, Kurt? I don't know what I am. I'll say that. Okay. I'll say in many ways, I hope I'm a Christian or in many ways, I hope that I hope that I'm a Christian. We can talk about that after. So Hildegard said, and pride germinated in the first angel as he no longer could comprehend the source of his own light. And so he spoke to himself. I want to be master and want none above me. Now there's so much in that passage. Pride germinated in the first angel. So talking about Satan. Then he spoke to himself, meaning extremely individualistic. Now that means like I'm, I'm a fan of individualism, but I think individualism gets taken to an extreme on the extreme left, which is about collectivism. And I'll tell you how that plays later. Well, I can give you a sneak preview right now because they say, I assert what meaning is. So if I dress up like a girl, it doesn't mean I dress up like a girl because who cares about what society says? I create my own meaning. And if I dress up like a boy, so on, so on, so on, so on. So I create my own meaning. That's extremely individualistic. Okay, so that's cool. That's what Hilde... No, and Hildegard also said that... Again, I apologize for my lack of coherent thinking. Hildegard also said, I want none above me. I want to be master. Now, that seems to be what divides the religious or some of the religious from the atheistic, which is, I don't want an external imposer of values. I want to run it. And now Jay Cubby said something interesting. I think it's from the 1800s. He said that you have to excuse me because I'm trying to remember these quotes. He said that man chooses either God or nothingness. Okay. Now either there's a God or there's nothingness. Now let's say man chooses nothingness. Then man turns himself into a God. Why? because it's impossible if there is nothing that everything I see is merely an apparition. I mean, it's impossible that that is not the case. In other words, it's all an illusion, like you referenced with Michael Shermer. Therefore, I'm the only thing that's real. Therefore, I'm God. So Jay Cubby said, it's either God exists beyond me or I am a God. There is no third option. There is a part. third option, and, and that's the point. Consciousness is an illusion, is an assertion that there, there not is nothingness to be above, but that your existence doesn't exist. The voice inside your head is not real. And so I, I, I kind of feel like when you go around this, you kind of miss two things that I think are central. One is the absolute absurdity of that. And I think you as a spiritual person who obviously understands that you are more, that you're not meaningless, that you have, uh, you, you have free will, these obvious things are taken off the, the equation. But the other thing that I think people who haven't processed the Christian thing completely, they kind of don't see how Christianity has been complicit in this whole thing and how they've set it all up. And that a lot of this stuff that we're seeing on the left is reactionary to the absurdity of a, a pedo pope, the absurdity of um, a cosmology within Christianity that is completely ridiculous. And yet we have to placate and be nice to Christians and quote unquote, respect Christian beliefs about Adam and Eve or Noah's Ark or the special day or any of the rest of that stuff. So there's two parts of that. One is uh, Christians have to understand the absurdity of their uh, 
proposition and of their cosmology and that the reactionary component of that. And then secondly, I think to misunderstand Shermer and to suggest that Shermer is an atheist in this kind of Gnostic uh, create better than the creator gods. I don't think that's where he's coming from. He's asserting that there's, that there's, He's okay as a biological robot in a meaningless universe who dies and then there's nothing. He hasn't processed how absolutely ridiculous that is. Yeah, I would say that he, well, first of all, I like Michael Shermer. Let's get that out of I the way. I do too. He's, he's one of my favorite frenemies, I always call him. Hey, I, I've had him on a couple of times and always have good times, good natured guy. And he seems to love the film Better Left Unsaid. And that, you know, that puts him in the, in the ranks for me. Okay. With regard to what he says, you have to also disentangle. This is why part of the film is, firstly, an exposition as to what's happened in the past couple of years, then a historical analysis, and then a psychological and almost, well, as, as you get deeply psychological, it's difficult to not sound religious. So, it, or let's say mythical, then it gets psychological and mythical toward the end. As for Shermer, as for people who say that it's meaningless, I'm also skeptical that they don't underneath, because there's a difference between professed beliefs and what they actually believe. I'm skeptical that they don't actually believe that, well, they're humanists. So that means that they believe that they contrive their own values. Well, they, they believe values are a social construct, which doesn't require any of the, I, again, I think you come at this from a Christian lens where you don't really accept the extent to which these people have bullshitted themselves into taking this absolutely philosophically absurd position that any culture throughout time would roll on the ground laughing with the idea that consciousness is an illusion that you don't exist and that you're not in there. It's, it's an absurdity that I think you're trying to kind of wrestle into something that makes sense rather than just, than just calling it for what it is. And then the, the real question that falls out for me for that is how have they perpetuated such a silly, silly idea? And that's where you have to ask the question, is there a social engineering uh, uh, motivation behind it? When you say that I'm coming at it from a Christian lens, what are you referring to? Because I don't consider myself necessarily to be Christian or because or when Buddhist you say whatever it may be. When you say that you gotta believe that Shermer can't really believe what he's saying. I get you. I'm saying that differently though. I'm saying no, he has bullshitted himself as the other atheists have into really believing that life is meaningless, that the world, that the universe is meaningless and that life is meaningless. And they are now in a state where they really believe that. They're not going to, going to bed and tossing on their pillow with the idea of uh, wrestling with that. You and I can't, can't quite get there because we can't even really wrap our heads around how someone could embrace such a silly idea. But I'm suggesting that they really have. There's no, there's no fake to it. Well, even if they say they have no values, their body acts as if they have values because they move. So they value something above sitting still and they value something above not talking if they talk. So just by their actions, they convey their values. And again, I, I just think you, you go back and talk to Shermer and ask him and see what his answer is. But what I've done with Shermer is- You can ask him, do you value science? Do you value truth? And he might say yes. He, he values it as a social construct. That's fine. That's fine. He can say he values it as a social construct. He no, still values it. I don't it. think it's fine at all. I think it completely, it completely skates the issue. The issue is, as you've put your finger on, I think, is there a moral imperative? The, the question is, who are we? Why are we here? And the, the, the question that falls out of that is, is there a moral imperative? Is there a good? Is there an evil? What Shermer will say and what they all say is, well, that's really a moral, that's really a social construct. There isn't any real objective good or bad. And you would I say, would I say, well, of course there is. From the time that we were a little kid and we stole candy from the candy store, we knew it wasn't the right thing to do. And we knew it as more than a social con contract. 
It was just something that wasn't right at a higher level that we didn't really understand, but we intuitively we got it. I don't see what you're saying as contradicting what I said. So there's two sources of values, or at least in Jacobi's formulation, that is either objective or external, which is God, or it is you, it is man. Even if man says it's socially constructed, that's still man creating it. That's almost by definition man creating it. So that's in line with what I was saying. No, I, I don't think again, we're in disagreement. Well, I, again, I think... I Tell me, dis you disagree that I agree. Well, the part that I disagree with is right. that man is the same. Man is, you can, what they've done here, the sleight of hand is to suggest that, that they can live with consciousness as an illusion. And then we can still talk about man and not being gender specific, but they are, when they say man, they are really alluding to consciousness to a, a self of who a sense of who you are in yourself so their inherent contradiction that we have to get to the bottom of if we're going to make any sense of this is that they are self-contradicting themselves when they say that there's a social construct created by man there is no man if consciousness is an illusion well about consciousness is an illusion just so you know i've never understood exactly what that means. For example, Dennett, I think is a proponent of the illusory nature of consciousness. And I read his book. I read at least one of his books, maybe two or three. And I, I think Darwin's Dangerous Idea is another one. But I don't quite, I don't understand what it means for consciousness to be an illusion. So I don't, I can't argue that that view is in contradiction or in coherence with something else, else because I don't actually understand what it means. But, but hold Hopefully on. Hopefully when I talk full, to... Hold it. Full stop. We, we have to be able to process that because that's what the whole thing is built on. The whole thing is built on consciousness as an epiphenomenon of the brain. That there is no you in there. Now, philosophically, that requires a miracle. Because the only thing you can know philosophically is that you are in there. I don't know if you're in there. I don't know if you're AI, but I know I'm in here. So what the sleight of hand that they've done with Dan Dennett, and I always play Neil deGrasse Tyson because he's the kind of one of the modern mouthpieces. Yeah, poster boys. And, and you can hear him directly say, I'll play the quote, but I've played it 500 times on this show. You know, I think when we get to the bottom of it, we'll find out that consciousness is nothing. So they're all saying mm -hmm. the same thing. And Shermer mm -hmm. is saying the same thing. I talked to Shermer about near-death mm -hmm. experience because the good thing about near-death experience science is it puts to bed once and for all the question of consciousness because consciousness is proven to survive bodily death. So now we can't really lean on the idea that's an epiphenomenon of the brain because the brain is gone. But this again, I mean, I'm hammering on this, but it is the fundamental issue that there's it's it's the fundamental misstep that the whole left has built its whole house on this foundation that is is completely wrong. Okay, when it comes to near death experiences, because I haven't studied it, when someone sees, what do they see? Do they see themselves after they die, or do they see other people? And do those other people retain their personality the same? relationships and proclivities that they had when they were alive or is it just you see them as an entity or you feel them you feel their conscious like what is it exactly well there's all sorts of different experiences that people have and a lot of folks have spent a great deal of time trying to understand them and categorize them in a scientific way which is useful but is limited it's limited because we don't really have a way of understanding what consciousness would mean if it extends beyond bodily death. Because back to our scientific and philosophical implications, let's stick to scientific. The fundamental question in science for as long as we've looked at the double slit experiment is, is consciousness somehow fundamental? So is matter not fundamental? Consciousness is fundamental. If everything is out of consciousness, 
then we have kind of a different thing where we can't really even talk about any of these things very clearly. But to answer your question, the most important thing that comes out of the near-death experience science, in my opinion, is just this point that clearly the neurological model of consciousness has been falsified. Because for the last 60 years, we have good science, if you will, on what it takes for a brain to generate consciousness. We have EEGs, we have fMRIs on animals and in people and under all different sorts of conditions. So we know that the condition that the brain is in when someone has been pronounced clinically dead in a hospital for three or four minutes before they're resuscitated, we know that neurological state should not be able to generate consciousness. So when someone is resuscitated from that and is able to recount in great detail their resuscitation process, you know, the guy, yeah, the guy wheeled me in and they tried the paddles and that didn't work. So, you know, somebody else jumped on me and then a nurse came in again. When they're able to, again, in controlled peer reviewed studies, they're able to give that information and people who didn't have a near death experience, but also had cardiac arrest when they're not, that's your control group. Those kind of studies are highly suggestive of the idea that consciousness survives bodily death and that consciousness is not an illusion. And it's really game over, not just for Shermer, but for Dawkins, for Dennett, for all the atheists in academia. They have to reboot everything and they are no way prepared to do that. But the whole thing in Better Left Unsaid and the extreme radical left, hey, man, we're with you 100% on the problem with microaggression and postmodernism. But I trace it all back to the consciousness is an illusion foundation that it's built on. Yeah, that, that's an interesting way of tying it. I didn't, well, when you think about this, if you were to randomly sample some people and they said consciousness is an illusion, versus consciousness is not, it's fundamental, or that I have a spirit or a soul, I think there would be a, a immoderate correlation between the right, which would say that I exist in some non-corporeal form, and then the left that would say, no, it's, it's, it's identical to the physical matter or in some way emergent from it. So that's an interesting angle. I need to explore that some more. It sounds like what you're saying is, Given these near-death experiences, and there are other experiences that I'm sure you can reference, but let's just talk about near-death. Given that, and the brain has zero neurological activity as far as we can measure, but also keep in mind that the measurement of neurological activity is in high, res high enough resolution to ever determine that there is zero activity for sure. Just at our resolution, there's zero activity. Just like with a camera, you don't, you don't have infinite resolution. Okay. Despite that, let's assume there's zero activity. Then that implies that consciousness while associated, see, that's why I would make the distinction. I would say it's associated with the brain, but not necessarily dependent on the brain. And the reason why I would make that distinction is because when someone says that consciousness is independent of the brain, well, then why is it that a lesion would make you more impulsive or rash or emotional or, or artistic when you weren't. So there seems to be an association. There doesn't seem to be an equivalence, which is what Dennett would say. And by the way, here's something interesting in an equivalence in mathematics, it goes, the, the, that means you have an implication arrow in both directions, which means if consciousness is the same, the same as a brain state, then that means you can replace brain states with the word consciousness. So when Dennett says that, well, your brain states are equivalent. I don't, I don't know enough, man, Dennett, like, like, I, like I said, when it comes to the illusory nature of consciousness, I don't have a, a handle on the theories enough to articulate them back to the people who are exponents of them in a manner that they would agree. So I can't say that I understand their theories enough. I know that there's something of Dennett's that I still need to read into called quining qualia. And it seems interesting because apparently it would explain why is it that we see red when we look why is it that red has the color red and, and blue the color blue and hunger the feeling of hunger and so on? Okay, let's get back. I'm going to wrap up quick. So here's a question about that. Why do you think that someone who's extremely bright, now Dennett is extremely 
bright. Dawkins is extremely bright. Shermer, you know, he's not so, no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> you get the idea. Why is it that they believe what they believe? You mentioned conspiracy. So I'm curious to know, is it something that they are willfully going against, like I referenced with Hildegard de Bingen, that I want to be master? Or is it something else that much like if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a, or a Buddhist, you grew up that way, you were just taught that way by society, and so you believe it. Is there something else that they were taught that they believe, or did they come to some conclusion? Are they evil in some way? Are they resistant in some way? What is their motivation for believing what they believe? I don't know, and I'm curious to know what you think. Well, I think it's a really, it's a really deep question, and I think it requires kind of a multifaceted answer. One part of it, I think, that I mentioned was the reactionary part. And that's the part where I think we really have to square up Christianity's being complicit in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now explain to me what you mean when you say that, because it sounds like much of your view is already Christian, but then at the same time you say that you dislike Christianity. Now, are you referring to institutionalized Christianity? Because that's there, a different. There's no there's, a whole there's other really beast. no other kind. You know, whenever I talk to uh, Christians, Not, well, okay, say, let me let me let me let me interrupt right here, because that's a mistake. That's a huge mistake. There's Chris, Christian mystics. There's Christian anarchists like Tolstoy. There's Kierkegaard, individualistic. One of my favorites. Yeah, and Kierkegaard also said that. Well, we can talk about Kierkegaard after. So, the, so there's, it's not true that there's no Christianity outside what's institutionalized. Ah, I, so again, I have, uh, folks, this is classic Skeptico inquiry to perpetuate doubt. If you're new to this, let me tell you, Kurt is a next level thinker, super smart. Check out his website, check out his, uh, his YouTube channel, his fantastic interviews. They're captivating, spellbinding, and, and, and they're great. And his movie this one and the other ones are terrific. So I want to pursue this dialogue that we're having, but I don't want people to get the wrong impression. I'm sitting here learning from Kurt by pushing him and hopefully he's pushing me. So that's what this dialogue is about. But, you know, returning to the question or the topic that we're talking about in terms of Christianity, Whenever I talk to people who are Christians, one thing I, I always start with is to say, I have come to accept that Christ consciousness is real. And a lot of times the reaction I get from Christians is a very negative one. They go, what do you mean Christ consciousness? You know, that's some kind of Gnostic bullshit that you're trying to pass off. And what I say is, no, I'm talking about it quite literally. When I interview uh, someone who has had, like I have, several people who are have had a near-death experience and have encountered Jesus, who they understand to be Jesus Christ, I have to pause and say, I accept that you entered an extended consciousness realm that we can't explain, again, because the medical neurological data doesn't allow us to go there, and we can't introduce some promissory some way in the future, though. The, no, everything we know says that the neurological data isn't there to support that. I'm now willing to support or be open to what you're saying about your experience, but you have to be open to the fact that you didn't experience Jesus per se, not in, you experienced a consciousness connection with Jesus at that level. Neither one of us know what that is. I'm going to call that Christ consciousness for lack of a better term. I don't know why Christians sometimes have a hard time with that, but I'll accept that. And I'll bracket that and say, I believe not just that I accept it, I believe that to be evidential because it's come up too many times from too many different people across culture and across time, which are the usual ways we'd look at verifying that kind of data. But I suggest to you, Kurt, that, that we need a disintermediation process here. You can access that Christ, that Christ consciousness with throwing your Bible out the window. You don't need your freaking Bible. You don't need Kierkegaard. You don't need any of those people. You can directly access 
that consciousness. Again, that seems to be the data as it comes back and not just Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, uh, uh, every, all the, I could list all the different ones, but you get the idea. So that's how I read the data is that we need a serious disintermediation that Christianity doesn't allow. Christianity, by design, puts itself in the middle and says, I will mediate your interaction with that hierarchy of consciousness that is God. Okay. So let me see if I understand what you're saying. You're saying that there are a variety of views that come up when one meditates or has near-death experiences or altered state of states of consciousness, and those are of a multiplicity of religions. And therefore, if Christianity, institution, institutionalized Christianity would say that Vishnu doesn't exist, Sashet, Mekhenet of Egypt doesn't exist, Buddha doesn't exist, or Buddha exists, but he, he's not a, a saint of any sort or divine of, or divine in any way, then Christianity can't be correct. Is that what you're saying? Is that close to what you're saying? This has kind of turned into you interviewing me which well, like I hear, I don't even know why I'm being interviewed by anyone because I feel like I know almost nothing. So I'm. Well, I, I don't know. I, you've just produced a fantastic movie, Better Left Unsaid, which is, in a way, we are kind of in sync here. Of like we said initially about so many things, I just end up interpreting it slightly differently. What Better Left Unsaid, the way it speaks to me is again, I hate, I hate using this word absurdity because when you overuse a word, then people get all bent out sure, of shape. Sure. But there's, you're, you're just saying, isn't this ridiculous? Isn't this exactly, how can we be trying to overcome racism by being racist? How does that make any sense? How did we get here? And then how do we get out of there? As for how we get out of here, that's a, that's a tricky one, man, because you have to want to get out of here. Okay. So maybe the answer of how to how you get out of here and how it started is tied. If you watch Better Left Unsaid, now there are two versions. I sent you the public version. There's a director's version, which is about a half hour longer, and it is much more philosophically and psychologically oriented. So I'll send you that one because you can just watch the last part. It's not, well, I'll send you that one as well. You might like it a bit more, especially given our conversation. It seems like there's a mistake that people make that people like Sam Harris and people like Cosmic Skeptic, who's a YouTuber, is extremely bright. He's young, so I, well, he's extremely bright, but I, it's a utilitarian approach that they think that we're aimed ultimately at the good. And I don't think that everyone is aimed toward something good. I think that most people, including myself, are aimed at destruction. And if you were aimed at the good, it would be a, an earth shattering, transfiguring event. And I don't think any single person on this planet is fully aimed at the good, except maybe Jesus, except maybe Buddha. Uh, can, can you so what do you mean you are aimed at destruction? That really struck me. I, I don't sense that at all. I, I sense that, that you're on the same journey that I'm at of trying to find the truth, trying to be a better person, trying to be more aligned with the, with the light. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say I'm a liar. I'm a selfish person. I'm, when I say I'm a liar, I mean, not right now, but I lie to myself. I'm a, I'm exceedingly selfish. I am not anywhere near as loving as it could be. I don't visit my parents as enough, as much as I should. I, I don't give Homeless people, I dismiss, I don't give them enough credit for what they're going through. I dismiss their problems. Often, I don't give enough. I think that if I speed slightly, even if it's more than slightly, that it's okay because I know better. I know how to drive. How fast do you go? Um, no, you look like fast, somebody who likes to drive fast. No, absolutely not. Actually, like I, my wife yells at me all the time because I drive slow. So that one is a bit of an exaggeration. And I, <laughs> See, but hold, yeah. hold up, bro. Hold up. So you said you read my book. Yeah. I hope you got to the last chapter 
because to me, it's the most meaningful chapter okay. for me that I got to yeah. in, in my many year investigation of this. I came to two conclusions, Kurt. Number one is we are more. We are not the biological robots in a meaningless universe that science is telling us. We are more. But the second part of that, that I would have to strongly disagree with you. We are good. We are fundamentally good. The evil thing, the dark thing gets way overplayed, bro. It's about the light and the light is always fucking shining. All we have to do is look up and whenever we look up, it's there. I make, I am in a constant dialogue with myself about all the things that I fail on a regular basis, on a minute by minute basis that you're talking about. I get it. I have four kids. Do you imagine how much I've messed up those four kids? I, and I have a wife of 30 years. Oh, I've tormented her for 30 years, but it doesn't matter. The light always shines, always drawing me towards being better, making better choices and forgiving everything that I could have ever done. That's, I don't, I don't. Agree Did you say forgiving? I don't understand your, your, your sense. Did you say the word forgiving? Did you What's say that? that? Did you say the word forgiving? I did. Or the light forgives you. Okay. Okay. But, but I think, let, let me go back. And I, I know I kind of did a little sermon there, but I, 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 let me tie it back. So people understand where I'm coming from. The most profound information we get from the near-death experience science. And at this point, there's over 200 peer-reviewed papers on near-death experience science. There's thousands of accounts that have been reviewed by medical doctors and said, yes, this sounds like someone who would be a candidate for having the amazing transformative experience that they have. Here's the number one thing that comes out. You, Kurt, will be judged. You will be judged for all the things that you just said that you do wrong. And you will be judged not by God, not by Jesus, not by Buddha. You will be judged by you, just like the way you are now. And in that extended realm, you will be loved and supported and told, it's okay, Kurt. You are just there to learn and experience and do the best you can. But you will still be in that state that you were in 10 minutes ago, as will I, when, when I'm saying, how could I have been so cold? How could I have been so unloving to my daughter at that moment? How could I have missed making eye contact with that person who just wanted me to smile at them as they crossed the street? How could I have done it? And I will feel that. But I will be the one who will say, I'm human. I'll do better next time. Jesus won't judge me. God won't judge me. They're just trying to lift me up. I will judge my own soul. That's what comes through from the near-death experience. I'm not making this up. That's what comes through from the near-death experience science. Like 90% of people, that's what they're saying. They're saying there is a God. It's all loving, all forgiving, and your judgment will be yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a quote. I hope it's a quote. I mean, I think it's a quote that hell is a prison locked from the inside. Absolutely. I think that's true. I think that the sins we commit, if you hold your, if you have a conscience, which is difficult to have, but if you have a conscience and you feel bad about it, you don't realize it's almost, it almost brings you to tears. Now, let me bring up Jesus just for the sake of this, even though you said that it's you that forgives yourself. But there's also some analogy between you and God in the Christian faith anyway, where it says you're made in the image of God. So it can go both ways depending on your interpretation, but let's just take Jesus as an entity. That you go to Jesus and almost angrily you said, you say, man, yeah, yeah, right. You forgive me for everything that I've done, even though I did it and I and I liked it when I did it. And then Jesus just says, yes, I forgive you. And then you just sit with that and you realize I'm a whore. You just want to cry. You don't realize that despite all that you've done, despite all that you've done, that you are actually forgiven. It's just you that has to accept that you're forgiven. 
And that's tricky, man. That's, that's not easy at all. Well, this is what's so beautiful about some of the beliefs that are interwoven into the Christian tradition. I still strongly believe that we have to disintermediate and that there, there's a cultish aspect of bringing along these truths, uh, having these truths bring along some untruths that can be really destructive in our life. And I think Christianity has to own that. But I fundamentally agree with you. That is a wonderful, deep, deep truth that you can build your whole life on. And, and I, I, right on. I'm, I'm t- many, many, many great, in, in many traditions, have, have kind of expressed similar ideas. I wrote some notes on your book. Let's see. I wrote that, yeah, you surprised me with this book. It's interesting to me, and that's not easy. Though the cover needs work, because that's what I wrote. <laughs> okay, so there's one quote. It's near the beginning. I like this. You said, mention evil, and folks look for a Bible behind your back. I like that. That's true. I didn't understand what PsyOps was and why you titled it The Devil is a Conspiracy. Yeah, I don't understand what PsyOps is. Is this relevant to the conversation? Because if not, then we can talk about that another time. I think it is relevant because I think there's a, it's relevant on a bunch of different levels. One of the things that I came to understand in this journey that I've been on, I mean, I really started as a science guy. I was computer yeah. science in school. I went back to get a PhD in artificial intelligence. I love the precision, you know, of it's not a math precision, but it's like programming is a wonderful thing. If you get one little semicolon wrong, the whole thing doesn't work. You want to talk about precision, you've got to be precise. It's great training, particularly for someone like me who's more of an abstract thinker. One of the th- so when I started answering the big questions, who are we, why are we here? I was drawn to science. I was drawn to Rupert Sheldrick, Dean mm-hmm. Radin. Don Hoffman, who I really interviewed 10 years ago, even though I just did a second interview with him now. Those were when the did, people- When was the second interview? What's that? When did you do the second interview? Like about a year ago. Oh, okay, okay. So, but those were the people I was drawn to. But the one thing that I came to realize in all that is one that science as we know it is best understood from a conspiratorial framework from a psyop, psychological operations. And it's not anyone who doesn't accept that 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 is the role of government. (laughs) You know, we look at North Korea and we go, wow, I mean, they're running such a fucking psyop, a psychological operation on their population. How could they do that? We look at China and we say it the same. How could they live with social credits? We We used to look at Russia in the same way. We seem to not look at them that way. But we never look at Canada. We never look at the United States. So as things gets revealed, you know, MK Ultra, that we were actively pursuing mind control and it's released into the public, we still deny that governments always felt that one of their jobs is to control the population through social engineering. Okay, how does that relate to Christianity? Well, I think what it relates to is when we're saying, you were saying in my book that you didn't really understand the idea of a psyop, a psychological operation. So I think Gloria Steinem and her involvement in feminism under the control of the CIA, under the direction of the CIA, mm-hmm. is the closest thing I can do to put my finger on a PSYOP that would be particularly relevant to Better Left Unsaid and the left. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's, here's, what's, here's what I'm wondering. Let's imagine there's this, let's imagine that's true. Then does the government also play PSYOP games, if you can call it that, with the right and then Abs- what absolutely. is their, so, so what is their, so they don't have a political orientation, left to right doesn't matter to them. They just want control. Is that correct? 
I don't know, but that certainly <laughs> rings true to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't want the guys with the torches and pitchforks storming the castle. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to your, your book is called Why Evil Matters. Something Correct. when we first spoke, something I'm interested in is what I call the source question which is an innocuous question is usually binary, maybe yes or no, that taken to its logical extreme leads you down to a route of evil versus good. I think I mentioned it to you and I'll explain what I mean. But going back to the government's acquisition of power, Jung, Carl Jung said that love is the opposite of power. And that's so interesting because that means when you're fully driven by love, you don't want power. You give it up. And when you are driven by power, it's the opposite of being loving. And there's in the Christian faith, as well as others, there's an there's extreme association between love and the divine. I, I think that's incredibly meaningful to me personally. It's a great thought bomb to, to drop on somebody. And, you know, I have Young up here in the, in the corner, but you just reminded me of one of his most profound quotes there. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I know this is not meant to be me interviewing you, but I did have a question for you. Do you think that the world is meant to be, now meant, obviously, there's a telos, there's a purpose there. Do you think the world is meant to be unintelligible? That is to say that we are not meant to know the answer. I think my answer would be your awesome Jungian truth bomb. It's like the difference between consciousness is fundamental and matter is fundamental. If consciousness is, and it's unimaginable, it's incomprehensible, but if consciousness is fundamental, then love is all there is. And we're constantly in this shadow dancing game of our attachment to the material, our desire, our interest in dark, but really the game is about love. And that's okay. unintelligible, as you're saying, to put it in your terms, love is the ultimate unintelligible, right? Hmm. Okay, now why is it that if consciousness is, as Deepak would say, ontologically fundamental, why is it that love comes in there? Because in Don Donald Hoffman's model, it's just experiences. There's nothing that privileges one experience over the rest. There's no love in the sets that he generates. They're just sets. So, so why is it? Why is it? Okay, let me say it like this. People who say that consciousness is fundamental. Now, I'm not saying that I disagree. I'm just saying people who say that generally also tend to believe that there is a God and that love is also fundamental in some manner. And love is somehow pervasive and overriding of all the rest of the experiences and qualia. I don't see how those two go hand in hand. I don't see how consciousness is fundamental implies God, nor do I see how it implies love. And I'm not saying I disagree. I just don't see how it implies. So please help me out. I, I don't think I, the word that pops to mind for me, Kurt, and I want you to riff on this as much as I am, is transcendence. That's why all the spiritual traditions point to transcendence, transcending, transformation, being born again. It's that they are not the same. They are completely in a different state. They're not intelligible. And another way to approach the intelligible thing that maybe you've run across, but people have extraordinary spiritually transformative experiences and they'll come back and say, I knew everything. I no sooner could even formulate a question in my mind that it was answered completely for me. And yet when I came back, I wasn't able to retain that. I don't have mm -hmm. that knowledge. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no worse truism than the spiritually mm -hmm. enlightened mm -hmm. individual that comes back and doesn't manifest that into their life, doesn't reintegrate it. And they truly had the experience, but 
at this level, they aren't able to reintegrate it. That's just, uh, we all see it, you know, but. Okay. So okay. That's interesting. Let me riff on that. So Dostoevsky had some, a particular kind of epilepsy, a, sorry, a particular kind of seizure that when he was, when it was occurring, it would feel as if God was giving him all the answers. And right when he was about to reach that point of comprehension, he would have a seizure. He would seize up. That's interesting because it sounds like perhaps this world, this material world, even though the material seems in some accounts to be engendered by the conscious world, this material world is the world that we, for whatever reason, cannot have all the answers. And as soon as we do have all the answers, that's something like transcendence, and then you no longer are in this world. Hmm. Okay, that makes me wonder why at all was this world created? It seems like the other world is blissful and it's where we're meant to be regardless. What's the point of this one? Well, that gets down to the, gets back to the perspective question. You know, are you at the top of the mountain looking down or the bottom of the mountain looking up? So maybe from our vantage point, back to your point is it's not that it's designed to be unintelligible. It's that, you know, the monkey brain that we have just doesn't have the processing power to, or not, not just the processing power, because that always puts it in the kind of this computer model that I think fails, but it's just that, no, it, it's, it, this is, we're doing, we're doing what we can with what we have. You see, this is why I like Kierkegaard. Let's get back to that. He said that most Christians, he would call them religious fanatics and zealots and militant Christians rather than true Christians. Because if you say, I know God exists, if you say that, you're not a Christian. Why? Because Christianity requires faith. If you say, I know this table is here, there's no faith in that. You know it. What faith is, is having doubt and uncertainty and making the leap regardless. So perhaps one, I'm just spitballing and freestyling in a sense. Perhaps one of the reasons we are here is to have faith. Because if we had all the answers, there is no faith. I, I right. love where you're going with that. And Kierkegaard, fear and trembling unto death is, is awesome. It is skepticos, you know, when, when I started this show and I named it skeptico, cause I have a, a Greek heritage half on half my side. And I just was looking up skeptic, skepticos. And I just didn't even know what it meant. Five years later, I went back and read about these philosophers and their ethos inquiry to perpetuate doubt. They were saying the exact same thing that Kierkegaard was saying that doubt is the most spiritual. Doubt mm -hmm. is the most spiritual because you are in the state of openness. Once something is decided, and I would suggest that even faith, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the famous Buddhist uh, teacher, Vietnamese Buddhist teacher nominated for the Nobel Prize and obviously super well-known. I love his riff on, on faith because faith is an impediment. Faith is a barrier. Faith is a way of holding back from truly accepting your predicament, from truly being open. I, I'm not saying I said so that sounds that like one. the opposite. That sounds like the opposite of what Kierkegaard is saying. Because well, Kierkegaard all would these things, love faith. Well, I, I think all these things, it, it gets into a, a, a semantics kind of thing, because I love what you just said about, uh, about Kierkegaard in terms of, you know, if you believe in God, that you're a believer and you're not leaving open, you're not open. You're not open to the experience. How can you be open to the experience if you've already decided? And mm -hmm. so maybe you're using faith in a different way than I would, but I, it was interesting for me to connect that with Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, you know, people who have faith, quote unquote, will not be able to see, will not be able to accept the transcendence because they're closed. They're like, no, I just follow this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. 
Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Let me think about that. Hey, man, you have been one, this is one of the most amazingly interesting turn it on its head interviews I've ever done. Um, let's return to the, to the movie, if we can. Yes. Tell folks sure. what the best way is for them to connect with Better Left Unsaid. Who it's for? Maybe we could go back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah, Who's yeah, the yeah, movie yeah. really for? Who's it targeted at? Who's going to get the most out of it? And then how do they okay. get their hands on it? The people who will get likely get the most out of it are people who are in the center, center left, center, center right. If you're, it seems like if you're more than center left, that you won't like it. And same with if you're more than center right, because I do have my critiques of the extreme right. The movie again is focused on the left. Now, people have said that's biased. It is. It actually is biased because I'm focusing on the left, but in a sense, it's also not. It's almost like they're saying, well, you know, there are other problems in the world. Yes, there are other problems in the world. So when someone, let's say, designs a table cleaner, like a, an all-purpose cleaner, are they doing the world a disservice because they're not working on the abolishment of nuclear holocaust or the abolishment of the potential of nuclear holocaust? Well, they're focusing on something else. So I'm focusing on the problem of the extreme left. And during that journey, it also takes me to the problem of the extreme right. And I see it in a similar manner of the horseshoe theory, though. Well, in a, it's, it's extremely close to the horseshoe theory. Touch on that a little bit more, because I thought that was a great, great point. The horseshoe theory essentially says, it's almost like non-duality. It essentially says at the extremes, they become the same which means the extreme left and the extreme right have more in common than they have dissimilar. And it seems like the only thing they have dissimilar is the extreme right has racial inferiority or some genetic inferiority of some other group. It pretty much just seems like that, like racism. It pretty much just seems, I couldn't figure out what else separates them because fascism, as much as the left or the extreme left dislikes it, the, sorry, let's say the communists dislike fascism. I would say fascism is closer to communism, then fascism is close to capitalism. And one of the reasons is that, well, there's a term called, I think it's Gleichschaltung. It's a German term. And it means the political unification, the unification of economic, cultural, and social institutions, the standardization, sorry, of that. And that's a term that popular was popularized in 1930s, Nazi Germany. So the standardization is a form of, is what fascists like, and as well as you know, like you said, we get into semantics. What is communism? What is Marxism? What is socialism? And so on. And I actually like semantics. I dislike when people say, you're just quibbling, you're hair splitting. No, I, yes, yes, you're right. Because the term quibbling, quid, quiddity. Okay, what does quiddity mean? It means a hair splitting distinction. But it also means the peculiar, the peculiar essence of something, the odd eccentricity of it. And I'm interested in that. Either way. Getting back to communism, Marxism, and the association between that and fascism. Well, it seems like at the extremes, they have something in common. What do they have in common? That is what I propose in the film. I come up with some tenets, I think four of them. And you'll have to watch the film to see which four. I think now that I've had some distance, I can distill that down to three. I think three of them implies the fourth or the fourth is not required. But either way, there's three or four tenets that unify both the extreme left and the extreme right. And they're, I wanna say equally pestilential because it's difficult to say what was the cause of people dying? So was it communism that caused millions of deaths or was it you know, causation is an extremely, extremely difficult thing to point out. So for example, when people die from COVID, what was the cause? By the way, I'm germophobic extremely. So I love the lockdown. Like I love when people wear masks. I mean, I'm like, I would want to wear masks my whole life. I would want to disinfect my hands. I've been doing that. I disinfect my phone every single time I come in. And my wife, she gets mad at me because she's not allowed to take her phone out of the house and bring it in without it being disinfected. So I'm a fan of that. So what was the cause of COVID? Was it that there weren't more people like me that are germophobic? Or was it that there was a government that was fast and loose with some policies of, of travel and 
cross animal contamination and so on. What is the cause? It's not clear what the cause is. So that's another reason in the documentary, I steer clear of saying communism caused these deaths. Instead, I, I look at some of the deaths that I think are extremely closely tied to the philosophical doctrine underlying communism. And those are much less deaths, but there's still plenty. And the same with fascism. So either way, at the extremes, the philosophy that that foments both communism and the extreme right seem to be similar. And I outline what that is in the film. Uniquely, even though it's been done before, your spin on it really drove it home to me in a way that I hadn't had never really thought about. So yeah. Where do people find this really great documentary? Left, it's better called left Better unsaid. Left Unsaid. Better, better Left, left unsaid unsaid film com. Better Left Unsaid Film dot com is where you can find it. You can also just search Better Left Unsaid on YouTube and the trailer is yeah, there. You get you get and right the there. links are in the description of the trailer as well as I think there's a Twitter account too. Yeah, Kurt, so that's that. It's, it's been fucking great. So great having you on. You're such, you embody so many of the wonderful things that you talk about and the the greater sense of uh, of light and goodness that oh, the movie so. brings forth. So. so thank you. I appreciate that. You're glowing, man. Think it's deserved. You're glowing. That's okay. awesome. Okay. I want to say one other, I want to give a tweak about the film. Yes. An amendment. Okay. So there are two versions of the film. Like I mentioned, there's a public version. That's an hour and a half. Then there's the director's version. That's my version. It's two hours long. The director's version is sesquipedalian. It's also tedious and abstract. So people, if you like this podcast, you're more likely to like the two hour version because it means you're someone who engages with ideas and you like to think but for the general public, like, let's say you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, my friend should watch this. They should probably watch the public version. It goes by much quicker. It's not slow. The director's version is more for academics and it can be boring if you're not an academic. Even if you're an academic, it can be boring. You'll see. So when you go to betterleftonsaidfilm.com, I think in about one month, so February, 2021 or March, 2021, you'll be able to choose between the public or the director's cut. If you buy it from iTunes, you won't be able to. You have to do it on the, our website because iTunes doesn't allow two versions of the film. So we're just going to release the public version on the, all the other streaming platforms. But the director's version is same price. You get access to both if you buy it directly from the website. So I just recommend going to the website and then buying it. Fantastic. And we'll have this out We'll try and sync it up with exactly the date that it comes out so people can listen to it and immediately pop on over. So you and I offline, will kind of figure out the best way to do that. But again, a man, congratulations, job well done. And thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Kurt Chimungle for joining me today on Skeptico. Be sure to check out his film, Better Left Unsaid. The one question I tee up from this interview is the same old skeptical question I've been harping on for the last few years is, gee, do you think all that absurdity on the left, on the wokeness stuff, do you think that's just accidental? Or could it possibly be socially engineered? You know my answer, but I'd love to get your take, especially since there's a slightly different twist here given all that's said in this interview. Let me know your thoughts, of course, Skeptico Forum or anywhere else you can track down the Skeptico folks. I have some good shows coming up. Lots of good, interesting stuff coming around. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.